Jesus. I've spent much of my career meeting men and women called terrorists in the West. It used to be said that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. But after 9-11, that seemed to change. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. Western politicians list dozens of terrorist organizations. I'll be breaking bread with those labeled terrorists by the West and ask, when does a man have the right to fight without being called a terrorist? I'm in a region of South America where few outsiders dare enter. The Colombian government has abandoned this remote jungle. I'm meeting one of the world's most elusive guerrilla groups, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, known as the FARC. They are left-wing revolutionaries who follow the teachings of Che Guevara. Their aim is to overthrow the Colombian government, which is a close ally of the United States. We defend the poor. We fight as an army of the proletariat. We fight for the people. But they are also accused of drug trafficking and the kidnapping and murder of civilians. In 2001, the United States listed the FARC as a terrorist organization. Terrorism is terrorism, and it's not acceptable no matter what the end result that's being sought. During the Cold War in Latin America, the United States created a guerrilla army in order to overthrow a left-wing government. It called these men freedom fighters. The tree of liberty has at times to be irrigated with blood. So is the war against so-called terrorists in Latin America simply another pretext for US military intervention in what it considers its backyard? Surrounded by the towering Andes, Bogota is the capital of a country that's been at war with itself for nearly five decades. In the old town square, a memorial to the man who fought for Colombia's freedom from Spanish colonial rule, Simon Bolivar. The effects of European conquest, though, have never been fully undone. Land has remained in the hands of the few, and fair-skinned descendants of colonial rulers have governed Colombia and controlled its wealth. In one sense, the history of this country is one of the rich and powerful being unwilling to accept social change. Thousands of trade unionists and human rights workers have been murdered by shadowy groups. And once the guerrillas emerged, the rich landowners set up their own private armies called paramilitaries to basically defend their interests. The paramilitaries had links with the Colombian army. As well as fighting the FARC, they killed civilians who demanded social change. This complex civil war has claimed nearly 50,000 lives. A journalist and old friend, Olman Morris, has been threatened by the paramilitaries. He has bodyguards day and night. Sinister groups have issued death threats after he started writing about human rights abuses in Colombia. Holman, I hate to say it, but death has clung rather eerily to most of my reports here. Our taxi driver was beheaded. A, a lady who we knew, she was gunned down in the street. It seems that whenever I leave this country, you know, I get news that somebody's died. That's the reality in Colombia. The armed conflict here has become a dirty war, where civilians are dying. Union leaders are killed, journalists are threatened. These are all people who don't carry guns. As the bodyguards looked on, Ullman told me that despite the appearance of calm in the cities, he sees no end to the war in the countryside. Sure, there's a safe Colombia now. That of the industrialist, that of the businessman, the Colombia of the middle and the upper classes. But there's another Colombia that's not safe today, the indigenous Colombia, the black Colombia. Most parts of this country don't have roads or large cities. And in these remote regions, people still live an insecure life. Se sigue viviendo inseguridad. 
my journey to the other Colombia, the home of the FARC guerrillas, began by traveling from Bogota to Cali and then on to Nariño province. This is a remote region where small isolated villages are dotted along the vast rivers of the equatorial jungle. My destination was the coastal town of El Charco. There are no roads here. The only transport into town is by boat. Nearly everyone is of African descent. I was told that Spanish conquistadors killed the indigenous peoples of this region and replaced them with slaves. I had sent messages to the FARC to arrange a rendezvous, and my instructions were to meet a man named Stefan. In this region, most local people do not see the FARC as a threat. It is the police who are the outsiders. Dressed in military fatigues, they check passengers for links to the guerrillas or to drugs. It's thought Nariño produces nearly a quarter of the world's cocaine. The next morning, I joined Stefan, and we headed up the Patia River towards guerrilla territory. This is uncharted land. The Colombian army have no permanent presence here. One of our team is from Bogota, and for his safety, we can't identify him. Our boatman, Stefan, said the guerrilla bases are hidden deep in the jungle. River for about six hours, and we also were detained briefly by the Colombian military. And they warned us there were guerrillas um, up ahead and that um, I could be kidnapped. Um, they were actually very polite about it all, but they insisted that we sign a document saying that um, my life was in my hands if I went up the river. As evening drew in, we approached a small settlement named Avocado. But in this region, little fruit is grown. The only crop on the surrounding hillsides is coca. The veins of the coca leaf provide the raw material for the manufacture of cocaine. Few outsiders visit Avocado. We weren't really welcome, and they told us to stop filming. There was no choice, though. We had to spend the night here. Stefan assured me that everything was OK, even though villagers later told me that if I was kidnapped in these parts, I'd be worth half a million dollars. That night, I recalled a meeting a few days earlier in Bogota with a man who'd been held hostage by the FARC for seven years. The kidnapping of civilians has brought Colombia's civil war from the remote jungle into the homes of the rich. Hundreds are imprisoned in barbed wire compounds. The FARC send video images of their captives to relatives with demands for ransom. Amongst them was Luis Eladio Perez, a senator in the Colombian Congress. For long periods, he was chained to a tree. It was like being in hell, seven years in that situation and under very difficult conditions. I personally had a time when I thought it would be better to end my own life so that my family could rest and stop suffering. Death would also have brought me some peace. Luis's family was featured in a television documentary while he was kidnapped. Angela and my kids were going through very hard times, and we didn't see any way out of our situation. Luis regained his freedom after a deal was struck in February 2008 between the FARC and the Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez. I don't know what I was thinking, but when I was released, it was the happiest moment of my life. When I came out... Back in Avocado, we ran into a problem as we tried to leave. Our boat wouldn't start. Stefan told me that the gearbox had broken. Do we need any parts or anything? I was unsure what to do. 
Just as we were planning to abandon the boat, we spotted activity upriver. A patrol of armed fighters appeared. It turned out they'd been looking for me. About 40% of the FARC are women, part of an army of some 10,000 soldiers. The FARC operates in small, mobile units. For the Colombian army, they're a hidden enemy. Che Guevara described the jungle as the ideal setting for rebellion. Gosh, it's only halfway to the base camp. I'm completely exhausted. OK, I'm not sure I'd make it as a guerrilla. The FARC was formed in 1965 when communists and peasants declared that democracy in Colombia only served the rich and their choice was either to stay poor or pick up a gun. At one time, commanders visited Europe and elsewhere to see a world beyond their jungle hideaways. It forced them to listen to criticism. Such visits would now be illegal because every guerrilla is categorized as a terrorist. Samuel is the platoon leader. He dismissed the terrorist label as cheap propaganda. Los gringos son terroristas, porque ellos sí quieren... The gringos are the real terrorists because they want to invade other countries in order to steal their lands. That's why they call us terrorists, but we are not terrorists. We are an army that fights for equality. The terrorists are those who invade other countries and impose their beliefs on them. War. That's terrorism. The FARC say that kidnapping is a way of raising money to buy arms. They point out that each year the Colombian government receives $600 million in military aid from the United States. We don't have tanks or planes or gunboats, so we use other tactics. We fight in small groups and attack their bases. If we attack a police post, we quickly capture hostages and retire into the jungle. The enemy hasn't got the capacity to move in there. Because we know the jungle inside out, that's where we take our hostages and immediately hide them away. They ignore the pain that kidnapping causes loved ones. The FARC consider it a legitimate act of war. Some of our guerrillas are caught, so we also hold some of theirs in order to exchange later. They free some guerrillas, and we free some of the people we have, who we class as prisoners of war. But why did the United States once train a similar guerrilla army, but called them freedom fighters, not terrorists? The statue of Augusto Sandino dominates the skyline of Nicaragua's capital, Managua. In the 1920s and 30s, he led a rebellion against US troops who had set up bases in Nicaragua. Two generations later, his followers, the Sandinistas, toppled a dictatorship and later won elections. But for the United States, there was a problem. The Sandinistas and their leader, Daniel Ortega, had the support of the Soviet Union. In those days, communism was said to be as much of a threat to the United States as terrorism is today. In 1981, the US established a counter-revolutionary army, the Contras, in order to overthrow the Sandinistas. But the Americans needed a reason for financing the rebels. They found one in an obscure airstrip that the Nicaraguan government was building. The airstrip was actually the longest in Central America and the only one capable of accommodating Soviet bombers. So the Reagan administration said that therefore Nicaragua was a potential threat to the United States. So because of this strip of concrete here, the United States said that it had the right to topple the Nicaraguan government. Reagan declared a national emergency. Uh, because of the threat to the national security of the United States posed by the government of Nicaragua. And he went on to say that the Nicaraguan army is only two days away from Texas. We're practically on the verge of being destroyed. The leader of the Contras was Adolfo Calero, an American-educated Nicaraguan businessman. 
He gave his fighters a guidebook illustrating the tactics that a freedom fighter should use to oust the government. It talks about throwing Molotov cocktails, you know, it talks about breaking tires, putting putting packs in the road, throwing bricks through windows. Well, I mean, is this, are these not classified as know, terroristic know, activities? If you know that there is an army convoy coming, even if you mine the road, it is an action against uh, this army convoy. If you uh, throw a, a, a Molotov cocktail in an ammunition dump, I mean, uh, that's obviously uh, not uh, terrorism. I mean, it's, it's a military, it's a legitimate military action. The CIA also issued a secret document that outlined what it deemed acceptable tactics to overthrow the Nicaraguan government. The Contras were supplied with a manual written by the CIA that advocated the killings of judges and other civilian uh, officials in order to sow terror. If you look closely at the U.S. run terrorist acts in uh, Nicaragua, uh, they're very explicitly fit the definitions of terrorism. So at one stage, the Southern Command, the U.S. military, which controlled it, uh, authorized uh, attacks on undefended civilian targets, soft targets, they call them. It says here it is possible to neutralize carefully selected and planned targets, you know, such as court judges, police officials. I caution them against using the word neutralize. I think that that handbook, the problem with it was a matter of semantics. It was not a matter of, uh, of instructions there. But neutralize to most people would mean to yeah. kill. Neutralize, to... neutralize uh, for me, uh, could mean uh, to render their actions useless or worthless. Neutralize means kill. I mean, there's no, absolutely no doubt that that's what they mean. That's a term that uh, clandestine agencies, certainly the, the CIA and others, have used for decades. I mean, I can neutralize your effort uh, by breaking your camera right now. I mean, I neutralize your your efforts. Huh? But you also talk about... I, won't, I, don't, I don't need to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> he knows better than that. It's just a pretext. Adolfo Calero is a highly intelligent man. I know him well. And until he got seduced by Ronald Reagan, he was really quite prudent and measured. But he was so thrilled by the high-level attention that he lost his bearings. At the end of the Cold War, the Contras and the Nicaraguan government agreed a peace deal. Guns and tanks from the decade-long conflict were symbolically encased in concrete at a memorial site. Yeah, many of these guns were supplied illegally to the Contras by the United States government. Of course, at that time, uh, Western governments and the mainstream media didn't call them terrorists. Um, they were resistance fighters, even though they would easily comply with today's State Department definition of being terrorists. During the Cold War, left-wing regimes in Latin America received funding from the Soviet Union. After the fall of communism, the money dried up. But the FARC found a way to survive, cultivate coca. I was on my way to a coca farm in Colombia's Nariño province a region under the FARC's control. The farmer allowed us to film as long as we didn't show his face. Nearly half of the world's cocaine is produced from coca grown in areas controlled by the FARC, providing the gorillas with hundreds of millions of dollars each year. Farmers pay the FARC a part of their income, what the gorillas call a tax. According to the United States, this coca farmer is a terrorist because he's helping to fund the FARC. Since the FARC was listed as an international terrorist organization, it's been illegal for anyone in the world, even left-wing opponents of the Colombian government, to finance them or support them in any way whatsoever. So they say they have to, by definition, raise money illegally, and therefore they do it by selling cocaine. And it's also with some amusement that FARC leaders say privately that <laughs> the last Marxist guerrilla group in the world is being financed by well-heeled party-goers in the United States and Europe. Adding petrol and cement to the crushed leaves extracts the liquid that will finally be transformed into cocaine powder. 
When I asked one of the gorillas about the cultivation of coca, he was unconcerned. If people in the West buy cocaine, he told me, why should it bother the FARC? The gorillas I was with seemed like soldiers from a national army. They didn't fit the conventional image of a so-called terrorist organization. They also seemed well organized. Lunch had been delivered by boat. What is this? Plantain. Okay. They asked me if I was enjoying the meal. <laughs> well, I tell you, this is the first time I've really had yucca and plantain in this form. So, um, no, it's tasty. Perhaps I didn't sound too convincing. <laughs> While the aim of the FARC is to overthrow the government of Colombia, the United States has helped to topple many regimes in Latin America. So, what's the difference between them? So, at what point do you think that it's legitimate to challenge an established government using violence? It's legitimate to challenge a government uh, that forgets about the interests of the people, that forget that governments are for the people. I think that when that happens, it is absolutely legitimate to challenge that government and to overthrow it, if possible. But that's exactly why the FARC says it has the right to overthrow the Colombian government. So why call them terrorists? I'm always skeptical about defining that movement as terrorist. I mean, it's hard for me to see that the FARC uh, is any more terrorist, if you will, than certain parts of the Colombian army. Remarkably, even a former captive agrees that that terrorist label is pointless. The fundamental ingredient in the FARC is misery, poverty, a lack of opportunity, and the huge inequalities that exist in Colombian society. If to be poor is a terrorist, if to be miserable is to be a terrorist, then of course the FARC are terrorists. But that's an expression that would have to be carefully evaluated by those around the world who, with double standards, say who's good and who's bad. It seems clear that listing the FARC as a terrorist organization has done nothing to address the roots of this country's violence or bring the prospect of peace any nearer.